Okay, well, welcome to uh, our bioengineering special seminar that we have today. Our seminar speaker today is Dr. Rory Cooper from the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Cooper is the uh, Associate Dean of Inclusion at the School of Health and Rehab Sciences at the University of Pittsburgh. He's also the uh, FISA, Paralyzed Veterans of America, Distinguished Professor at Rehab Sciences and Technology at the University of Pittsburgh. And he also happens to be my previous chair from the Rehab Sciences <laughs> and Technology, mine and Karen's previous chair um, from when we were at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, Dr. Cooper has published over 300 peer-reviewed journal papers. He has uh, 20 patents. He and his team have developed over 100 different inventions focused on improving mobility and the quality of life for those with disabilities. He has been elected a fellow in the uh, National Association of Inventors, the uh, Rehab Engineering Society of North America, IEEE, American Institute of Medicine and Biological Engineers, and uh, M uh, BMES, right? Did I get them all? Yeah, uh, no, and the Royal Society of Medicine. Oh, the Royal Society of Medicine, okay, I didn't know I was aware of that. So not only is Dr. Cooper a professor, an educator, an inventor, he's also an athlete. He's a medalist in the uh, Paralympics. He's won numerous gold medals at the National Veterans Wheelchair Games, which is why he is here uh, in Louisville for the weekend. And he's been gracious enough to take time out uh, from his competitions and the research that he has going on there at the games to be able to deliver a presentation uh, to us today. So let's welcome Dr. Cooper to Louisville. Thanks, Gina. I think actually most important is I was on your doctoral committee. Yeah, you were. <laughs> Funny I forgot that one. <laughs> Well, it's great to see Heather and Karen and um, Gina, all former students of mine, and Rosie and Rachel are on our uh, team in Pittsburgh as well, are here, uh, although they were not students of mine. <laughs> um, and uh, just to give you an idea, that's uh, Bakery Square, that's where our, uh, where Hurl is located at, and um, it's an old Nabisco cookie factory, 101 years old now, converted to a research space. It's almost a Google research park because that's the Google's the largest tenant in the area and this is Bakery Square 1 there's a Bakery Square 2 and a Bakery Square 3 uh, as well and uh, Google op occupies Bakery Square, most of Bakery Square 2 and the Bakery Square 3 is going to be occupied by Philips when it's completed so it's pretty cool we're right in the middle of a pretty uh, high-tech research uh, park and Carnegie Mellon's in this space if you heard of the Software Engineering Institute uh, they're in the same building that we're in, so uh, we occupy half of the fourth floor and the basement of this building. So we're pretty fortunate. We have about thirty thousand square feet of, uh, of research and office space, which I'll show you a little bit of that as we go along. Um, so I'm an engineer uh, by training. Uh, I thought I'd show two things. Kind of gets to this. I love this cover of this. Is the cover of the IEEE. Spectrum Magazine. If you don't know, IEEE is the Institute of Electronics and Electrical Engineering. It's the largest engineering professional society in the world with about 400,000 members and uh, looking for engineering heroes. And then second is this um, Howard Rusk. If you've heard of the Rusk Institute in New York, uh, Howard Rusk is the founder of that. He was actually a doctor in World War II in the Army and then he happened to be a friend of President Roosevelt's and he ran the um, Armed Forces Rehab programs at that time, especially the MPT care program. And he was a strong proponent of allowing soldiers to continue on active duty after becoming severely injured and believing about to work as a tool for uh, rehabilitation importance of work, which unfortunately is still an issue uh, today. Um, I told people free. I'm going to go back. I'll just give you a little preamble. This next video is a, a video that is uh, that Google did about her all. Um, Matt Landis, who is kind of the star of this video, was a, a student and a Google fellow and now works in Hurl. Um, and it gives you a nice overview and it gives you a little tour. 
it might be helpful to let everybody know that HURL stands for Human Engineering Research Lab. Yes. So that's that's the center that I uh, spend most of my time at. The other titles that Gina mentioned are mostly administrative responsibilities. <laughs> Distractions. But you're not nearly as fun. I tell people frequently, and I really mean this, is kind of like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. I get to play with robots and all these technologies. Our mission is to apply engineering and advanced technology to improve the mobility and function of individuals with disabilities. A large number of them are our veteran population. Every day that you come in, there's this kind of wonderful energy here. From students, to staff, to faculty, we wouldn't really be living up to our, our mission if we didn't include people with disabilities in all aspects of what we do. Our vision is a world where everyone with a disability can participate on a level playing field to their greatest extent possible. I've got a disability, you know. I certainly wouldn't think of myself as disabled, but it was having a huge impact on my life, on my wife and my children. We can do better than that. We, we have to do better than that. So I work here because I want to give everyone an equal opportunity to whatever they want. Disability shouldn't be the thing that prevents them from getting those things. Good, so I'll give you a little bit of an overview. I hope you enjoyed that. So, um, you know, one of the things that we believe in, I think you, you too as well, that we are getting, uh, being involved in the clinic and engaged. I hope you saw from the video, we have, a, uh, we're about 70 people, uh, about uh, uh, 40 of them are faculty and staff and about 30 undergraduate graduate students uh, work together. And a large percentage of them are actual individuals with disabilities and veterans now as well. So that's been a focus that we've developed over the years. Uh, and those, you know, they're engineers and therapists and um, other uh, statisticians, other types of scientists, all working together. We work closely with the, our University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Center for Assistive Technology. Uh, Rosie is the director of that center, and uh, Brad DiCiano, Dr. DiCiano, is an engineer and an MD, is the medical director of the CAT and also the medical director of Hurl, and that works out very well and kind of making sure that our research problems are grounded. We're a little bit different than a lot of research places because we're more problem driven rather than intellectual curiosity driven. Um, I also want to kind of sell you on the idea of, of participatory action engineering or participatory action design and engineering. So we uh, engage end users throughout our whole process from user need identification. We do a lot of storyboard work thinking more like graphic novels or making a movie uh, to, to guide our research now. Uh, Mock-up systems, we do a lot of uh, rapid prototyping, some 3D printing, we have all the common 3D printing machines. Um, we do in-lab data, focus groups, we'll do in-home data, we'll do multi-site trials, we do global trials. We have a full uh, test lab for prosthetics, walking aids, wheelchairs. And um, we uh, even work on regulatory approval and contribute to clinical uh, practice guidelines and insurance coverage. And that's the other part of working closely with the, with the clinic as well to uh, make sure that people have access to this technology through various means. Um, we had the good fortune of, of doing some research too on um, how technology can promote inclusion and being involved in a National Research Council uh, report and a National Academies report looking at the power of assistive technology to promote reintegration and reemployment. Uh, I actually started way back in the 19, early 1990s uh, uh, doing research in um, how and why we should include individuals with disabilities in rehabilitation research. Um, naturally because they're the end users and they should be uh, uh, not only participants in our research studies but actual members of the research team. Um, I've also recently uh, started looking, I guess that's what happens when you've been around for a while, and so doing the new technology, but looking at what, what are the barriers, why, are, why, why don't we have more individual disabilities in STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields. And so through some work through the NSS Education and Human Resources 
um, division, we've been looking at barriers, and one of the most common barriers are um, laboratories. So I bet you could look at your own laboratories and find out whether a person who's visually impaired or mobility impaired or has upper extremity impairment can participate in all the laboratory activities. So we're looking at modifying lathes and milling machines and other so and what we found in our research is that at most universities and community colleges that uh, individuals with disabilities wind up being observers and note takers rather than participants. So how can we change that? And then uh, I'm, a, I'm a veteran, that's why I'm here participating in the Veterans Games and doing research and been helping looking at the transition programs for veterans as well. So uh, we spend uh, 12 weeks taking a civilian and converting them into the military, but when they get wounded, injured, and ill, how do we transition them back to be successful veterans in their community? And some of the resources needed for that, like counseling resources, technology resources. So, you know, the, believe it or not, um, up 10 years ago, neither the DOD, the Department of Defense, or the VA had assistive technology laboratories. And that's a critical aspect of helping severely injured in, uh, veterans return to their uh, their communities. And been working with the uh, Canadian military as well because they're a close ally of ours. So this is get about changing prosthetic policy, wheelchair policy. We still have a ways to go. So uh, we just finished, I haven't published it yet, this has been published, but um, our second Voice of the Consumer study. Uh, this is data on about 1,000 people. We're up to about 1,500 people in this original study. Uh, the newer study is about um, 800 people. Um, so this study, we, were, we wanted to um, get an idea of two things. What are the barriers and what are the areas of research uh, that uh, related to engineering that consumers thought were most needed. So the, so the barriers are pretty obvious. Live uh, let with, uh, without a caregiver, with less assistance from caregivers. So, uh, if, you've, if you've studied individuals or know individuals with severe disabilities, finding good caregivers and reliable caregivers is very, very difficult. And getting the insurance or the government to pay for sufficient hours of caregiver assistance is very difficult as well. And so technology may be able to fulfill some of that work. To be able to go to work or school or be more productive at work or school was a goal. And to meet personal mobility, it's homework and neighborhood, and to travel. And there's a, right now, I don't know if you know, the Air Carrier Transportation Act is under revision. And so there's a lot of discussion in some ways about air transportation. Um, as a matter of fact, we, I've been approached to do a project that uh, where you might, uh, we're about, like we have for, um, Gina would know about this, but transporting wheelchairs on a, in a motor vehicle, that you actually could stay in your wheelchair on an airplane. That's um, a PVA, Paralyzed Veterans of America, and some other organizations have been advocating uh, for power wheelchair users to be able to stay in their wheelchair when they, tra when they fly on an airplane. So we're trying to look at the requirements for that and how we can make that safe. Uh, but the research areas were kind of interesting. We, we were able to cluster them into five areas. Uh, wheel, advanced wheelchair design, uh, smart device applications, human machine interfaces, and assistive robots and intelligent systems. And then uh, participatory action design and research, you know, being able to be engaged in, in the research itself. And they also sort of, that had subcategories of universal design, policy, education, this is mostly consumer and clinician education, uh, standards and reliability, and then the dissemination and knowledge translation. How do we get the research that we uh, do in, applied into practice? And then we have uh, we found some themes within the advanced wheelchair designs, alternative power sources. That's not surprising. Most power chairs still rely on lead acid batteries. More recently, you see more lithium uh, polymer batteries being used. Uh, because of you know, laptops and smartphones and uh, and uh, tablets and things like that, and the, they're becoming more available. Of course, you know there's challenges with flying, and actually a battery big enough to put in a power chair is not allowed to go on an airplane according to FAA standards. So you wind up with a little bit of a problem there uh, when you get outside of lead acid technologies. But I'll show you some things we're doing: uh, collision avoidance and actually obstacle negotiation. So. 
if you think about it, there's been a lot of research basically translated from uh, mobile robots to do obstacle uh, uh, avoidance, but not actually negotiating obstacles. So instead, if you see a curb, instead of trying to find the curb cut, which may be a half a mile down the road, you're actually climbing the curb. Or if you see a steep ramp, negotiate that ramp rather than avoid the ramp. And then lighter chairs, wearables, environmental controls, smartphone home technologies, and then uh, better alternative controls, brain computer interfaces, graphical user interfaces. Uh, both autonomous and semi-autonomous robotic wheelchairs, navigation assistance, exoskeletons, and transfer devices all came out in the robotics areas of theme. So those of you that Dr. Patachi's class are probably known we um, we're bringing back the smart wheel, but I have to kind of go over some of this because um, it really led to ergonomic push room. So when I first started studying this in the 1980s, about 80% 80 of manual wheelchairs that used a wheelchair five years or more wound up developing uh, carpal tunnel syndrome or rotator cuff injuries. And if you're familiar with the literature, a lot of those individuals reported that those injuries were like acquiring a, not a secondary disability, but more severe than their original disability. <coughs> that actually kind of led to that whole concept of what secondary disabilities or secondary conditions. Um, by looking at proper wheelchair design, wheelchair setup, and now ergonomic push rims, that is down to about, that incidence is down to about 20%, which is huge. It's a billion dollar um, savings in carpal tunnel and rotator cuff surgeries. Not only, not to mention, to, you know, the quality of life changes for individuals with disabilities. That was largely uh, due to the um, the smart wheel, which um, originally invented as a graduate student, and it measures the push room forces and moments, and now it's used in about 120 labs around the world. And then later, we um, the problem is you have this chicken and egg problem when you do research. Originally, we were using X-rays and MRIs. And the problem is you can't couldn't can't get the forces and then get the x-ray or MRI immediately, right? It'd be because you have to schedule the time and the machines. So we actually did some work early on on high frequency ultrasound. Now this is one of those things, if you want to solve a very clinical problem, sometimes you have to do some basic research. So Mike Boninger and I did work on uh, early development of high frequency ultrasound heads. Uh, a lot of that work was done with Philips. Uh, that allowed us to do up on the top uh, there's the uh, biceps tendon and looking at, uh, so then you can do a, collect smart wheel data, immediately collect the ultrasound data on the, on the biceps tendon or where the green, that's the median nerve in the carpal canal. And you could see whether there was flattening, whether there was any edema, um, and you could correlate that to propulsion style or how to how push room style or wheelchair type. Um, and, that led those little graphs on the bottom left to showing how you could get rid of impact spikes, how you could improve efficiency by, by positioning in the wheelchair. Um, so if you go over to the veterans games over in, uh, in the convention center, you'll see now that about probably a third of the veterans are using either the natural fit of the surge, which are two of our, our patents that came out of that. And that take, if you from with the standard hand room actually if you look on the smart wheel picture closely, it's the old, you know, basically um, three quarters of an inch round tube that Harry Everest and Herb Jennings used in 1932, which caused you to use a pinch grip. And we've been able to change that to more of a tool grip, and that helps reduce the uh, force on the wrist and the shoulder, and which means, and of course, if you set the wheelchair up, you can lengthen the stroke. And then, of course, your propulsion is based on work, which is force over distance. If you re increase the distance, you reduce the force further. And that's what's contributed to reducing those, those injuries among yeah, individuals used to be in wheelchairs. So, now this group is a bit unique because they're here, uh, but uh, most individuals who use wheelchairs uh, live sedentary lifestyles. It's interesting, so what used to be the problem of rotator cuff injuries and carpal tunnel syndrome is now actually tr uh, translated over to uh, what we call metabolic diseases, like diabetes, obesity, heart disease, uh, various conditions, uh, because a lot of our 
uh, wheelchair users uh, live uh, sedentary lifestyles, and um, they really don't know um, how to exercise or what's the best way to exercise. Now, I blame part of this on the fact that uh, lengths of rehab stays have gotten so short and most places have eliminated recreation therapy that uh, they don't get the time to, um, to learn in rehab uh, healthy lifestyle choices and healthy lifestyle activities. And, it's, and if they go back home and they eat as much food as they did before, uh, but now they have spinal cord injury or limb loss, um, within a year they'll be borderline obese or be obese. And so um, we're you're piggybacking on the app, you know, sort of fitness craze. But one of the challenges of if you buy down the apps that you can download is that uh, unless you walk with a quote normal gait, uh, they're pretty inaccurate. And so you know, it's easy buy a Fitbit. Um, I'll pick on them because that core technology was actually work that we did with Carnegie Mellon University, which was the body media, and then they bought body media, and body media became Fitbit. Um, if you put one of those on a person with cerebral palsy and have them walk around, it'll give you all kinds of wild, crazy data. Um, or you put one on me, and it, it'll say, I don't go anywhere at all, all uh, day. Um, so uh, the idea is put a sensor on the wheel, put a sensor on the wrist, so between those two, you can get a pretty good correlation of the uh, amount of activity and the type of activity and um, how people, and then get their caloric, and that's, we get their caloric expenditure through indirect calorimetry, which is sort of a gold standard for activity level, and there's other, other methods as well. But this is kind of fun. This is data on about 50 people. They have an activity monitor. They've gone through training. It's been tuned to them, and um, they know we're monitoring them. If you look at the, just look at the graph on the blue, that's the more, on the left, that's the more important one. So the light blue is sleeping. The darker blue is sedentary activity. Um, and then the sort of beige color is, um, is, uh, I mean, blue, darker blue is inactivity and the vape color sedentary activity. That's, that's, and this is aggregate data. And red means they're active. So there's a lot of sedentary activity going on here. It's also interesting in the day. So there's little bouts of about 15 minutes. Um, Saturday and Sunday seems to be the best day for some reason. That active time, there's a big block of active time there in the red. So you know what happened on that day? What was that? Wheelchair basketball. No. Shopping. No. That's when the grad student went out to download the data. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that's all right, you know. Gotta move around. Rachel's coming out. Oh, I better move around today. <laughs> Um, wow. Which, if you've done been around like I have for a while, where you did like paper surveys, we always feared that, right? That that, that people would uh, had to turn their paper survey in, so they fill it out, you know, five minutes before you you collected them. It's no different than students doing their homework, you know, 15 minutes before it's due. Uh, so people have those habits. So you know, the course now the question is, how do you coach people to actually? Monitoring people is obviously not sufficient, so how can you coach people to change their behavior? Um, so one thing we started working on was, um, if you look at uh, any of the weight loss routines, they all rely on the ability to weigh themselves, or for the person, participants to weigh themselves frequently. But that's not easy for wheelchair users. Unless you happen to live close to the PT clinic where they have a roll-on scale um, or you have the means to buy one and the space in your home to have one, um, you can't do it. So uh, we developed a bed scale. I, I like this picture because I took that, that's in our shop in Earl, so you can see we can make large quantities of items uh, if we need to um, and do some pretty excellent machining. 
And I also did all the printed circuit boards and everything as well. We have a complete uh, commercial quality printed circuit board fabrication in-house now. And um, these scales fit under the four posts of the bed. And so basically every time you get in bed, we can, we can weigh you. Uh, it has a little bit of artificial intelligence or machine learning built into it because if you have a partner in bed, it actually can disambiguate between the, the two people in the bed. That's why we use all four feet under the bed. It's kind of interesting. Uh, we're working with some collaborators now looking on also, uh, do people roll over in bed often enough for pressure ulcer prevention? Looking at maybe sleep quality, how much do you get in and out of bed, or, or how, um, do you move around, how much do you move around while, while in bed? And so hopefully um, this will help address some of the problems we saw with just activity monitoring. And then uh, we've got engaged in coaching as well. Um, so we use contextual awareness and some machine learning to help individuals who use power seat functions to um, comply with the guidance from their therapist. So this problem came about really because Rosie said, um, you know, I, I prescribed these $30,000 manual uh, power wheelchairs with power seat, tilt, recline, and uh, leg rest elevation, and people still come back with lymphedema or pressure ulcers. We don't understand why. So uh, we developed instrumentation that we could put on people's chairs and we measured how much they use their seat functions. And then we found out that they use them frequently, but not as instructed. Mostly to do minor postural changes for comfort, but not sufficient changes for uh, pressure relief or for improving venous return. And so uh, that said, well, how do we fix this problem? So when we first started this, we literally bolted a, a single board computer onto the back of their chair. And now, of course, we transition pretty rapidly to using the, the smartphone. And um, this is a product now available. We patented this. It's called the Virtual Seating Coach, and it's licensed to Permobile. Uh, it's actually free on any Permobile chairs, if you're interested. And it, um, so it gets coaching instruction on how to use the power seat functions. It measures, it looks at if you've done your pressure relief when prescribed. If you haven't, it gives you instructions on how to do them. It shows you how much you need to tilt. And it tells you to tilt before you do recline so you don't have shear. And then it uh, does a countdown of uh, how long you need to stay in that position. And that's uh, the programming it can be done by a clinician or by a technician. And, uh, cust and it's customized for each individual. And then if you do a good job, it also, it, well, it measures your compliance as well. And if you're fully compliant, it doesn't do anything but monitor. It never comes on. But if you are not compliant, then it gives you reminders um, and instruction on how to do it. Because we found reminders on them all oh, don't work. You need to, if a person doesn't know how to do something or doesn't know how to get feedback, then there's no point in reminding them. You're really not a coach at that point. You're just nagging. <coughs> then uh, the other thing it does, and so by, the, by just kind of doing the coaching, we were able to get, uh, we were able to uh, get a fourfold increase with compliance. So, um, which basically should translate into a fourfold reduction in pressure ulcers or lymphedema. But it turns out, we talked to some behavioral scientists and they said, if you do some rewards, so if you play any games on your phone, you know about that, then you play Candy Crush or whatever, you get um, rewards for that. So we added another aspect, which you got a little tree that flowers, or a little smiley face that goes to a frown and turns red, and um, that got us an additional fourfold compliance. Because people wanted the tree, so if you were not compliant, your tree turned brown and had no leaves and no flowers. <laughs> if you were fully compliant, you got leaves and flowers. And people, um, I don't know if you watch the Big Bang Theory, and there's a little thing where uh, Sheldon uh, got uh, one of the little digital pets from the 1990s, right? And he's 
that's, you know, 1919 and his pet's still alive. It's kind of that same concept, right, that you uh, keep your um, yeah, keep your tree going. And then we also added um, a moment to ecological momentary assessment, which means it brings up surveys about pain or uh, comfort or um, or other other areas, whatever that scientists or clinicians may want to know, like feedback from the clinic, that you can bring up on uh, either event-based or time-based. Event means to use contextual awareness. You say, "Oh, hey, it looks like they're just hanging out doing nothing. This is a good time to uh, ask them to do a survey." Or, and that's what we do with the reminders. That's where the contextual awareness is important. Is you want to find out. When are people most likely to follow your instruction and ask them to do something at that time? So if they're driving down the highway, you don't ask them to do tilt and recline, right? You, but if they, if you find out that oh they, you know, they normally eat dinner from uh, you know at six o'clock and at seven o'clock they're going to watch TV, that's a good time to ask them to do tilt and recline. So now we're trying to do this with manual wheelchairs. Uh, it's a little trickier because you've got to get the person to move their body. And there's people like me who are somewhat good at doing um, pressure reliefs, but more because I'm a wiggler, I'm a, they call it active sitter. And you don't want to bug active sitters. You just want them to keep doing what they're doing. So we um, added, an, uh, so we have a machine learning component that looks at what, if you're an active sitter. In other words, do you move around a lot? Um, one easy way to look at it is all of you will move during this talk, pretty much. You know, a little bit of shifting here and there. You'll flex the muscles in your rear end. Um, and um, that'll help with your uh, the, you know, cellular nutrition and blood flow, capillary blood flow. And pe some people that continue to do that even though they um, have, uh, might have loss of sensation. And others need to... Um, learn to actually do the proper pressure release. And it's a little hard to see, but we give images on the app. And then I should mention that both coaches are connected to the cloud. We can aggregate this data. Um, we haven't had a chance to really analyze the power chair data, but we have data now on 50,000 people. So you could do some really cool stuff when you know activity, pressure, you know, seated activity from 50,000 people. The idea of the manual chair, too, we have to keep it light, you know, so you don't really alter their manual chair and get it harder to transfer with. So that's some things we're, we're working on at fairly low cost. There are some people that no matter what you do, they're just not going to learn. Or they're just not going to follow instruction. Um, I don't know if there's any nurses in the room. They all know that pretty well. Uh, but um, that's, I think, a big part of what nurses do is try to get people to sort of help themselves. Uh, so we are working with the University of Texas on an, uh, a smart active seating system. So there are active cushions out there today, but if you know anything about them, really what they do is they just do a, a standardized routine um, of uh, alternating pressure around uh, typically four quadrants. So they might do the front two quadrants, the rear quadrants, so they may do some sort of clockwise or counterclockwise rotation of the quadrants. Now, we thought there might be a smarter way to do that. And so um, that up there, that's a fully instrumented simulated butt. Um, uh, we have about 32 degrees of freedom on there that we can measure. Um, we actually piggyback, we originally developed that for the Department of Defense to test helicopter seats. If you're familiar with, you know, you fly a long time in helicopters, there's a lot of vibration transmitted, and Gina knows in the 1990s, a little lot of whole body vibration research. And so um, we then said, oh, this is, we could use this for testing cushions as well, because we would know uh, shear forces, and we'd know um, normal forces, and all the different forces in different directions on the buttocks in different segments. And so um, we developed this cushion with Utari that basically says, um, no matter what you do, we're going to minimize the pressure. So whatever position you're in, you're always going to keep the pressure, redistribute that, that pressure to be minimum. And so the, just the top upper right picture show 
the internal pressure mapping versus the external pressure mapping. So basically every one of our cells has a pressure sensor. That's the beauty of having your own printed circuit board making ability and having a, a digital, I mean, a MEMS a pressure sensors available at low cost. And then that correlates pretty well with the pressure mapping systems. Probably our data might even be more accurate because pressure mapping systems aren't all that accurate to begin with. And then the bottom one shows just an inflated cushion, nobody's sitting on it, the person's sitting on it, and then we have two algorithms, an offloading algorithm, which is kind of what we do with um, non-smart cushions. In other words, you distribute the pressure over areas that you think can tolerate the load and you try to take it off of other people's, other areas. So this is basically Rosie and Rachel are both PTs, so I'll pick on them. This is basically what they would do. This is their knowledge of how they would fit a cushion. And then, then we did, let's use the data we have and redistribute the pressure to minimize the pressure across the entire surface. And you can see we can get rid of all the reds and all the yellows. So that's our, our goal. So we're, what we're trying to do is be better than Rachel or Rosie. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about some of our robotics work. Hi, my name is Josh Rachong. I am a researcher at the Human Engineering Research Lab. My research project is focused on the performance evaluation and the user interface of the assistive robotic manipulators. So the assistive robotic arms is that a robotic arm can be mounted on the wheelchairs and uh, that can assist uh, wheelchair users or people with a disability to do uh, some daily tasks uh, using the control interface. So, so the reason we developed the interface is that uh, we have tests with the current uh, robotic original interfaces and uh, a lot of users have difficulty learning those uh, either take some, memorize the keys or memorize the command or a combination of uh, different keystrokes. So the interface we did develop kind of a reduce those uh, frustration so they can quickly learn how to use, control the robot and they can do the task run just uh, within 10 minutes. There was one veteran who get our robot and he is so, so he was so excited and he, he said, he just point to the robot and, and say to the, the caregiver, that's what I want. So I, I think the robot would be really helpful for people sitting in a chair and still want to achieve something for their lives. So it's good. But this is a project we do with uh, Kinova, which makes a robot. The Heather's got one. And they license this technology. A lot of the control algorithms in that are Dr. Chung's work um, in the Kinova. Uh, it's also kind of fun, um, if you look on the bottom, you know, robots need tools like people to be effective. So we 3D print a lot of tools. Um, but it's also interesting because we work with a lot of OTs on this project. Uh, of course, they stole all our tools uh, because uh, if they work well for the robot, they work well for people with limited hand function because essentially that's what a robot is, is a, is a limited hand function. Um, we're all trying to do now, trying to uh, it's more and more practical tasks. If you look on the lower right, we've been making pancakes. There's over 111 steps to make a pancake. Uh, the robot can make a pancake. Um, so far, nobody wants to eat the robot's pancake. <laughs> but um, that, you know, that's sort of those, you know, uh, most people want is, you know, activity daily living tasks in the bathroom or in the kitchen for assistance. Uh, Part of that, we're looking at different end effectors. What do we want a three-fingered hand? We're looking at power prosthetic hook end effectors. We're trying to classify uh, of, of the normal grips that people use. Um, which of those do you really need to perform like 90% of the task? Can we simplify the end effector and make it more reliable? 
And then also, what activities, what type of grass or what type of forces do you need in order to perform those activities? So classifying those, that work. Uh, we, uh, we happen to have 3D. Uh, we have a SLS printer. We have a FDM commercial printer. We have an object commercial printer. Um, uh, we actually have a full production SLS printer now. It's about the size of this table. So it makes its own powder, makes its own nitrogen, continuously runs. Um, and uh, so we do some cool stuff with it. So this was a project we did with Walter Reed. Uh, uh, a lot of amputee and burn patients coming into Walter Reed and Brook Army Medical Center, and they couldn't use the patient-controlled anesthesia device, which is a device in order to uh, give yourself a little bit of anesthesia so you don't have to call the nurse all the time. And um, so we basically, and then it turns out if I, I, the simple thing would have been take the switch off and modify it. We called the FDA, they said you can't do that without running the machine through the testing again. And of course the company didn't want to pay for those expenses. So we basically made a 3D printed shell to go over the top that could be mounted to the bed rail and people could activate it with their head, they could act it with their elbow, with their feet, some even with their hip. And then we wound up manufacturing about 100 of these units and just distributing to Walter Reed and to Brook Army Medical Center. And it's, it's funny how these things go. I literally got an email this week uh, from the VA saying that they want, because um, these veterans have now transitioned, now they use the VA, they might be coming back to the hospital for some other condition, now the VA wants us to make a batch of them for them to distribute. Um, this is actually one of Rosie's clients you can see her in the background, um, Alec. Alec, uh, you can uh, you know, obviously if you look closely, he has a pretty uh, severe tone from cerebral palsy. Um, Alec wants to be able to use one of our, our robotic arms. He um, doesn't have, he has uh, extensor tone, so every time he tries to move his tone actually gets worse. And so he, he couldn't use the normal tablet or phone interface that Josh showed in the original video. So um, this is the beauty of, we, uh, we made a 3D printed piece that would capture his phone, which is, has a fairly small screen that he can then control without him. And we added a, um, a zero throw joystick, which I think I might have a, a picture later. That's something I invented back in the 1990s. It's, we originally called it a um, isometric joystick, but it's one into it, well. It used to be in a lot of uh, smartphone. I mean, just a lot of laptops and stuff had that little rubber joystick. So that was something that I invented a long time ago. Uh, between that, he can uh, now control this robotic arm, and he's working his way through the appeals process with the insurance to uh, to get the robotic arm. But the first test was he had to be able to show he could use it independently and operate it independently. We had to develop some individual controls for it. But really, Alec is just a test case. Right? There's other individuals with advanced ALS or MS or cerebral palsy that would be able to use some more similar controls. Even in the kitchen, where um, something as simple as we, preparing meals can be a real change. So we talked about meal preparation. Uh, we're also working on our kitchen bot. Um, I have a couple students work on that this summer, where the robot would actually help Even with in the meal kitchen, preparation. Where something as simple as preparing meals can be a real challenge. This kitchen is designed for people with Alzheimer's and brain injury. This is the queuing kitchen, where specially designed computer programs provide cues or step-by-step -step instructions for cooking things like pasta. When I click next, the program will give me my first instruction on, on how do I get started with making pasta. Take out cooking pot from the lighted cabinet. Take out pasta from the transparent cabinet. Fill the cooking pot with water from the water faucet. Turn the faucet off. Place cooking pot on the stove. Turn on the stove. This program is ideal for someone with cognitive or memory loss problems. But for those who need more help, 
there's this futuristic device called the Kitchen Bot. The Kitchen Bot can turn a faucet on and off. It can also open cabinets and drawers and operate appliances. It's a sophisticated instrument that moves up, down, and sideways and can be programmed for a specific or a group of functions. And it's cut. And so, um, and this is another robot. This is our strong arm robot. Uh, that's what we call it, robotic assisted transfer device. And it's to, um, it mounts to the person's power chair. It can, it's ambidextrous. It can, it can rotate around the back and be on the left or the right side. It can lift up to 250 pounds. It essentially replaces like a Hoyer lift or something like that. Um, and the person basically just uses a little handheld um, Back, back to one of those isometric joysticks to uh, move a person from one surface to another. The nice thing too is you can stay in close proximity to a person, kind of um, so they feel safe. You don't need two people. And you're not trying to negotiate like a big Hoyer lift and the wheelchair in a bathroom or come to the games like this. The wheelchair, the robot actually can drive off the end and go into like a Pelican case, a plastic case, so you can take it with you. And uh, so we're doing some studies on this, user studies now. Um, so one of those caregivers, so it reduces the EMG stress on the lumbar spine of caregivers, which is, you know, with the current, even without transfer devices, is huge uh, impact. Even with mechanical transfer devices, there's pretty severe back injuries. Back and shoulder injuries are most common. Uh, the usability scores were very favorable as well. Um, we have now users. This is a dummy being transferred. Now we trans. Now we have users and caregivers working together to transfer them, and um, we get very very favorable responses from the users as well. Actually, the main response from the users is, "Can we get rid of the caregiver?" <laughs> and I just transfer myself. Um, so well, that gives us something to work on in the future. Um, so another challenge you might find is um, getting in and out of bed from a wheelchair. Um, so we were for, uh, approached by some uh, elder, uh, the spouses of elderly veterans that said they'd like to take their husbands home. So, um, and one of the problems they can't is they couldn't get them in and out of bed. And so we were, uh, started working with a company out of um, Massachusetts that makes hospital beds. And the, the, the kinematics aren't quite synchronized here, but you can see where we basically, uh, the bed comes up to meet the chair, the, um, and the bed, can, the bed, chair kind of pours the person in the bed while the bed pulls the person in. And we try to match these kinematics. It's better now, it's a little bit older video, but. Um, and uh, Jessica has cerebral palsy, she can't transfer herself. And Josh is just lifting the feet a little bit, so that, because heels are the common you know, area of pressure ulcers in older adults. So I'll tell you, one of the most moving stories for me is, we took the prototype over to our long-term, VA long-term care facility, set it up in the lobby, and let clinicians and veterans and their spouses come by and see what we were doing. And this one veteran spouse, Carol, uh, she was in her 80s. Her husband had been in the nursing home for three years. So we transferred her a few times and she went through the whole process. And, and um, she came back, she left, and she came back about an hour later with her husband's physician and said, I want one of these for my husband. And after, um, uh, so we, we worked with the VA, we made a prototype for her husband, um, and uh, she got to take her husband home after three years. And he lived another nine months at home before he passed away. We actually started a little bit of a revolution. We got six other veterans left the nursing home. We had to make more and more units. So it's, it's good from a research perspective because we didn't have to do any recruiting. We just had to build them. Um, and uh, so that... That was a manual chair version. We built a manual, the chair kind of picked up the manual chair and dumped them in bed. And that, the, a lot of feedback was, can we have a power chair version? And so we had some VA funding to continue this research. And then um, the other thing, of course, they want is, can you add a commode chair? 
So that way the person go up, do their, act, their kind of their morning routine, get back in bed, clean up, and then go back and do their thing in, in the day. So that's a workout. But the whole goal is zero lift transfers in and out of bed. Um, I mentioned this earlier. Actually, that, that's part of the patent drawings on the left from the when we first did the isometric joysticks, and we did a lot of algorithms related to it too. Um, if you find that the headrest there is kind of a, I'll just tell you briefly because it's not too much time left, but um, this is, we were, said so a lot of individuals with traumatic brain injury, severe traumatic brain injury, they, um, they don't do a good job of visual scanning. Uh, but a good thing about it is they don't tend to use their eyes to scan, they use their head to scan. So they little, put a, little, a whole bunch of Hall effect arrays on the headrest, took a little colostomy cement and glued a magnet on the back of their head. And if they weren't looking where they were going, the chair just wouldn't go. So they point the joystick they wanted to go and they had to look that way and then they could go. And it was really interesting about this project is we thought we were really clever, we'd, we'd put this on, people have their headrest, and they would go dry. That's not what happened. You give it to people like Rosie and Rachel, they put the thing together, they have people drive, and they keep making them drive until they don't need it anymore. And then they go home. <laughs> and so you could sell like one to every clinic, but you could not sell, the people didn't need it, they just needed about two hours of training. And of course, then you get people like Rosie that say, well, I don't need that at all, and I just need to know, I just need to have a, 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 an attendant joystick on the back that I don't let them go unless they look where they're going. So um, it's good, we learned a lot. We, it turned out we didn't need engineering to solve the problem, we just needed to give the, uh, the therapist a tool on how to better train people on how to drive power chairs. Um, I worked for about 10 years of my life with Dean Kamen on the iBot. I just want to show that that's back. Still has some problems with the seating system. And we still have to have pretty good upper bodies. Uh, control to use it. Uh, there, um, they were at. They were here in Louisville this week. Uh, but I'll show you some other cool of our our systems. This is our Perma. It's a robotic wheelchair with bidirectional manipulators. I saw Dr. Collins walk in. I think he might be behind the post there. I'm not sure. Oh, over there. Uh, he helped with us on this project. Um, this is Elaine. She was one of my graduate students. So this is a fun, I like this project for two reasons. Uh, I think we were the first one to have a mobile robot with bi-manual mobile manipulators with a person in it. Uh, this is a real store. Um, we also work with social scientists, Rich Schultz and others at Pitt, if you're familiar with them. Um, and so they were studying the responses of the employees in the store and the uh, shoppers to having Elaine uh, another shop. And we were studying so uh, how the control, so she's using a combination of the tablet and voice control, that's why she's got the headset on. So the manager has, we have the manager's approval, everybody else doesn't know what's going on. So, there was something funny about that transaction. Did you notice what was unusual about that transaction? So Elaine gave him his, her wallet first, and then the items she wanted to buy. We did that because when people gave the items first, the store clerks would say, oh, it's on me. It's, it's fine. This is so cool. And uh, just the participants thought that was pretty cool. They were going to get a robot today if they could get free stuff. <laughs> so we changed our protocol to pay to give a wallet first. So I showed you the, the iBot. Um, one of the problems with the iBot is this is Dr. John Bay Kim. He was a student of mine a long time ago. He's now the chairman of the Department of OT at Yonsei University. And um, he could not never, he could never really use an iBot. And this is an eight-inch club. And we wanted to, so we use um, attitude control, so that the chair stays level. It also can do this on a cross slope and slopes as well. And all he has to do is um, push the switch forward, and the chair automatically does all the kinematics to climb the curb. 
Um, it's got some sensors on the on the front. We use a um, it's a ra we're using a radar la a laser ultrasound sensors to detect the curve um, location and height. And uh, and he, if you noticed, he could he let go of that switch a few times. It always keeps him in a statically stable position. And he could actually reverse it and have gone backwards down this place. And now he's basically doing the same thing. Uh, to go off the curve. Uh, sign me up. <laughs> Stop by tomorrow. You can try it out. It'll be in the convention center. You'll get. You could be the brand new ones on its way. So this one has pneumatic actuators. Literally at five o'clock this morning, my team and Earl just finished the new one with electrohydraulic actuators. How much does a chair like that cost? About a million dollars, but that's because there's two of them. Uh, once it becomes commercially available, we're shooting for about a thirty thousand okay. dollar cost. It's really not that more expen more complicated than Heather's current chair. Uh, we just took a lot of the actuators that are in the seat and put them in the base. So you soon get all the. But now you get silt, seat tilt, seat recline. You can tilt forward. You can tilt backwards. But you get seat elevation. But you can also use it to negotiate obstacles. So rather than have a base that stays static and a seat that moves, you make the base dynamic and the seat static, and then you get all of the other features basically along with it. Um, so the, I, I just have to put up this picture on the bottom because it's one of my favorite. So those are all students of mine with spinal cord injury. So John Bay on the left, and now Siva, he's actually coming here, he's on his way, he has an incomplete lumbar spine. And then Senin, uh, he has actually um, congenital spinal cord injury, high cervical spinal cord injury, which is, is fun. I've had about now over a dozen graduate students with spinal cord injury, it's pretty fun um, to have them be scientists around the world. And thanks to the Nielsen Foundation, they funded a lot of them. Uh, that. Uh, and they seem to, every, if I can find them and get them through graduate school, they'll all pay for it. So, um, all engineers, by the way, too. So I mentioned the power sources earlier. This is one of our attempts. It's a common summer seed. Children playing in the water, splashing each other, or going down a water slide. But for some kids, like Sam, water is an obstacle. We typically avoid water parks because we know there's the ladder scaffold involved. You have to get up to the slide. And also, the rides in the water parks typically be, I just aren't good for someone without balance. So that's just in general water parks and challenge. And being in a power wheelchair makes it even more difficult. These wheelchairs run on electricity, and when water comes in contact with them, the results can be shocking. So how do you build a water park that all kids can enjoy? That's the question Gordon Hartman had. He runs the world's first accessible theme park, Morgan's Wonderland in San Antonio. We had to come up with a wheelchair that would uh, allow for it to get wet and still be able to move about uh, through the use of someone's um, ability to uh, use a joystick. That's when he discovered the work of Dr. Rory Cooper at the University of Pittsburgh School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Dr. Cooper is world-renowned for numerous patents and inventions when it comes to wheelchair technology. He's dedicated his life to improving assistive devices for people with disabilities. I found Dr. Cooper from the first conversation we had on the phone as a person who really wanted to work hard at ensuring that this idea that we had of developing this chair, which would truly be revolutionary. Gordon and I have the same vision. That's uh, uh, a world where all everybody can participate together. So the people with and without disabilities are on the same playing field. And the idea is that, hey, an air motor with air tanks, if it's feasible, may uh, provide with a much lighter power chair, uh, much more environmentally friendly, that doesn't need to have the batteries replaced. And from that idea, a new chair, short for pneumatic chair, was born. The new chair is powered strictly by compressed air. There's no batteries, so that makes it waterproof. We can recharge it in as little as 10 minutes. Unlike current battery wheelchairs, that could take up to eight hours. It could revolutionize the wheelchair industry. Brandon Daedler, 
A current graduate student at Pitt School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences is a researcher studying under Rory Cooper. Their team works out of the Human Engineering Research Laboratories where they modeled and built the new chair. The chair that makes a challenging trip to the water park, well, fun. I like to have the freedom to run around. It was rewarding to see just how he lit up and the enjoyment that he got out of going through the sprinklers and the water. He wants to be independent. Quite frankly, we let him go for 30 minutes by himself. And that's what he wants. And Rory thinks children without disabilities who witness this independence will be influenced too. That's the kind of experiences you want kids to have so that when they grow up, they don't have those biases and they can say, hey, oh, oh I've, you know, I've seen people with disabilities do it just like I have. The positive influence of the new chair doesn't stop there. The granting agencies and the clinical work sort of force you to think about and a, a lot of more of the medical aspects of life. And um, it, was, it, was, it was great to see how much uh, demand and energy there was for um, just having fun. I've already seen uh, uh, how this chair has made a difference in the lives of those with special needs. The reason we are where we are today is because of Pitt, the commitment of Dr. Roy Cooper, and all of his close staff and everyone involved who have made the dream of this chair possible. And I think in many ways we're just beginning. I hope it expands through water parks. I mean, we've been contacted by different, the National Park Service and the state parks for putting it at uh, wave pools, beaches. I also think, uh, you know, it's got a lot of potential for, still for long-term care facilities, and nursing homes, big box stores, and we have grocery stores and things contact us. Gives us hope that one day we won't have to worry about any type of barriers in our world. So the cool thing is that chair is commercially available now. It's at uh, Morgan's Inspiration Island down in San Antonio. And, and Brandon started a company based on it called Atomize, and so he's, he's bringing it out. So if you don't believe that technology works, I, one of my hobbies is um, I chair the Paralympic Sports Science and Technology Committee. Actually, since your dean is here, I will also say that one of the reasons it's important to travel internationally is you see the collaborate with Dr. Kim, um, uh, actually, uh, uh, Senin, who was in the picture, is at now at, uh, Professor at Aachen University in Germany. And the air motors that I, or we worked on for that pneumatic chair were developed at the University of Stuttgart by a friend of mine, Urs Schneider. And so, you know, if you, to advance technologies, it really now is a, takes global collaboration. If you don't believe um, the power of technology, I'd like you to just watch this video if you haven't seen it already from the Paralympics. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. 
Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Hey, yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Think the, the Olympics are cool. That's how we started the Paralympics with that jump and jump through the Olympic rings. Wow, is that for all the Yeah. yeah. So, um, see what we do in Tokyo. <laughs> um, so, uh, if you, uh, I mentioned about you know, or Gina mentioned about being an adventure and all that. Sort of my my latest adventure is that. Uh, I was uh, inducted into the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office's collectible card, collectible card series. Um, so, just to give you some perspective, number one, in the, I'm number 28 in the series. I'm the last person to be inducted. Number first person to be inducted, of course, posthumously, was Thomas Edison, Nikola Tesla, Abraham Lincoln, Temple Grandin. So, uh, pretty Steve Wozniak is in there, Dean Kamen, a few others. Uh, Pete Conrad was the astronaut, was inducted as 27. So, these are Americans that have changed, uh, their inventions have changed America economically or socially. So, it's kind of fun. Heroes. What's that? Heroes. So, I, I brought Gina as oh. a little gift. <laughs> my, uh, my card. Nice. So, thank you very much. So, I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity. Pleasure to be here. All right, well, thank you for that very inspiring uh, seminar, Dr. Cooper. So, questions? I know you guys have questions. You gotta have some questions. <laughs> so, you're just stunned. Well, come out this week, right? Through Tuesday, the, you've got. Uh, 600 athletes from throughout the United States and Great Britain just down at the convention center. Um, I recommend if you come out uh, tomorrow and Sunday you'll get to see the obstacle course competition and that's pretty cool to see what uh, 